The Lord be with you. Welcome to this worship service on the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. And again, I say if you're used to sitting here in these church pews, you are, of course, most welcome. And I want to say reassuringly that though we don't know exactly when, we will be back here for worship. Uh, possibly as early as the 30th of August. We'll have to see how the numbers go and what the governor says. But I do want to give a most special welcome if you are tuning in from wherever, from across uh, state lines, city lines, country lines. I know we have uh, an audience that even uh, extends out to other parts of the globe. So know that our worship here is made complete by your presence and your participation. And I certainly thank you. Uh, This morning, following this welcome, uh, we will have a ministry focus by Elizabeth Perkins uh, announcing an upcoming concert. It's coming up very soon, but she'll give you the details. Uh, A duo concert with uh, Elizabeth singing and Cameron Edbiston at at the piano. And this is a wonderful opportunity they've put together to raise funds for Presbyterian disaster assistance. And then the flowers, the beautiful flowers that you will see one yet once again uh, are in memory today of Professor Gordon Tate and they are given by his friends. And one of these months, one of these weeks when we have a chance to be back here, we will have a full celebration of, of Gordon's Uh, wonderful life, well lived. And by mentioning the flowers, I also want to extend an invitation for any of you who might want to remember someone or honor someone to to produce the flowers, to get the flowers, I mean, and uh, we can give you a florist and and, uh, pick them up here in town. And now, let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Hi everybody, I'm Elizabeth Stockton Perkins. I'm a member of First Prez and I'm a vocalist. And together with my friend, Cameron Edmiston, who's a pianist, we have put together a feel good, optimistic virtual concert that we are hoping to use to raise money for Presbyterian disaster assistance. Basically, if you donate a free will offering to Presbyterian disaster assistance, we will send you the link to this concert so that you can watch it. There are a few ways to donate. First, you can mail a cash or check to me. My email is in the church directory, and then I will forward that on to PCUSA Disaster Assistance, or you can make a donation online directly to Disaster Assistance and then let me know so I can send you the link to the concert. I know this is a lot of information and it's kind of hard in this medium to communicate it all. So if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. My email address is presbyteriancookies at gmail.com. And I'm hoping that this information will also be in Tower Tidings, maybe in the bulletin for this Sunday. So again, my email address is presbyteriancookies at gmail.com. And the concert is premiering on Saturday, August 1st at 7 p.m. So I'm hopeful that some of you will feel called to donate and then we can all watch this optimistic, uplifting concert together at the beginning of August. Thank you so much. Good morning. Today's service music comes from three Baroque composers not named Bach or Handel. First of all, Giuseppe Tartini from Italy, John Stanley from England, and finally, Nicholas Bruns, who was born in Denmark, but spent his brief lifetime in Northern Germany. Tartini was known as a composer for the violin in particular, and he has a famous piece uh, called The Devil's Trill, which has given violinists nightmares for decades, centuries, I guess. Uh, The musical offering is from John Stanley, who's probably best known as the second most popular trumpet voluntary for weddings. Remember weddings? And finally, the postlude is by Nicholas Bruns, the northern German composer. He died, unfortunately, at age 31 and only left us with five organ works. But he was an influence on no less than J.S. Bach, who you can imagine admired his pedal solos and the long pauses to utilize the acoustic of the glorious churches in northern Germany. Thank you.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship. We stand on the shore of God's new day and look ahead to what is yet to be. We hold close the precious treasures of biblical stories, past experiences of God, and the wisdom of our ancestors in faith. Yet we move in God's spirit to experience something new. May old and new blend in the way we respond to God's surprises, as well as God's steady hand. Come, let us worship our God who comes to us in newness each day. Let us pray. Such love you have for us, O God, revealed in creation, embodied in redemption, poured out in spirit. By the light of such love would we love. By the power of such love would we hope. By the grace of such love would we serve you and others. Amen. Please join in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, when words of welcome and openness have not been matched by our practices, forgive us and make us whole when we have been a stumbling block to another's journey rather than a trustworthy companion, forgive us and make us whole. When we are afraid of change and neglect the gift and privilege of love, forgive us and make us whole. You hear our prayers, O God, even when words fail us, but you do not fail us. Your love holds steady and welcomes us into greater love. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. Hear this good news of grace. God comes searching for us, calling us by name, leading us into the peaceable kingdom. In Christ, we become new people. Broken, we are made whole. Lost, we are found. Forsaken, we are restored to new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Hello, tomorrow starts our very first day of our virtual VBS called Compassion Camp. And during five sessions given throughout a couple weeks, two and a half weeks, we are gonna learn how we can show compassion to ourselves, we can show compassion to others, and how God shows compassion to us. It's gonna be a great time. So if you are signed up, I look forward to seeing photos and videos of your week with us. And if you are not, please pray for those families that are going to be doing Compassion Camp and know that this is a time that we need to see and show compassion to everyone. So today I thought I would read a story. It's called All Are Welcome. Pencil sharpened in their case, Bells are ringing, let's make haste. School's beginning, dreams to chase. All are welcome here. No matter how you start your day, what you wear when you pray or play, or if you come from far away, all are welcome here. In our classroom, safe and sound, fears are lost and hope is found. Raise your hand, we'll go round. All are welcome here. <clears throat> Gather now, let's take part. We'll play music, we'll make art. We'll share stories from the heart. All are welcome here. Time for lunch, what a spread. A dozen different kinds of bread. Pass it around till everyone's fed. All are welcome here. Open doors, rush outside. We will swing, we will slide. We'll have fun side by side. 
all are welcome here. We're part of a community. Our strength is our diversity, a shelter from adversity. All are welcome here. We will learn from each other. Special talents we'll uncover. There's a big world to discover. All are welcome here. So much to learn, so much to do, and when the busy day is through, can't wait to come back, start anew. All are welcome here. Head for home to get some rest and greet tomorrow ready and fresh. Our time together is the best. All are welcome here. You have a place here. You have a space here. All are welcome here. So I hope that you will appreciate our Compassion Camp and know that we are spreading the love of Christ and letting people know that all are welcome here. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity we are given to spread your love and to show compassion to others and help us to let people know that all are welcome in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray together. God of all the ages and of this day, God of all the winds of space and of our breathing, God of all that lives and of the beating of our hearts. We come to you because you have come to us, calling us into community with all the people who call on you in whatever nation, in whatever language, in whatever need, in whatever hope. We come to you as members of one family, separated for a time, but belonging to each other. We come to you from our homes, sitting with our parents or with our children or with a loved one or by ourselves, but through the miracle of community as one family. We come to you without some members of our fellowship who were a part of this family before the virus came among us but are no longer here, whose names we remember today. Gordon Giffen, Connie Holby, Donald Knowlton, Edna Oswald, Betty Schull, Vanessa Swank, Ty Turning, Gordon Tate, and for those with long memories, our former pastor, Harry Everts. We come to you today with some new friends, some whose names we know, some who at this moment we don't know by name, but whom we welcome into our family today. We come because we want to, because we need to, because you are our strength and our guide, because in the words of the psalmist, you are closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. Hear us, we pray, and help us to hear you. We pray this day for those who steer our national craft through the icy waters of this pandemic. May they refer often to their charts and maps which trace our history and describe our principles. May they be alert to all the dangers around us, the shoals of self-centeredness and the icebergs of conflict. 
bring us in your time to the port of national safety with our ship whole and our crew intact. We pray for all who today are suffering loneliness and who yearn for physical contact and personal closeness. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, especially those who have been robbed of the chance to share final moments with those who are the victims of this cruel virus. We pray for those who see themselves as victims rather than as people whose concern for others leads them to act responsibly. We pray for those whose plans have been put on hold or scuttled completely, that they may, be, that they may find, at least for now, some fulfillment where they are and with what they have. We pray for those who have been locked in nursing homes and retirement centers for their own safety, unable now to move into the fresh air and enjoy the healing balm of nature. We pray for parents and teachers and children and teenagers and school staff, for grandparents and neighbors and good caring friends who are negotiating the uncertain months ahead. What a time, gracious God. What a time for us to learn once again to lean on you. When all has been done and every avenue explored, to place ourselves in your hands, not as a shield against life, but as a place of strength and of calm and of outreaching and enveloping love. It is in this spirit that we prepare for the week ahead, in this spirit that we pray in the name of the one we come to know as our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who still today teaches us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
It has been 20 weeks that we have been um, knowingly in a pandemic. Uh, we've also learned that actually it started perhaps a month or two early with exposure here in the United States. And even just this last week, it's as if we have new horrors visited upon us. The virus is spiking uh, all across the country, and even here in what has been relatively uh, lower levels of infection in Ohio. Around the world, there are natural disasters, monsoons, earthquakes, uh, a scourge of locusts even. So our brothers and sisters around the world are dealing with many things other than just the threat of infection and pandemic. And even here in our own city, cities, and especially the city of Portland, uh, ununiformed military personnel, army personnel, are attacking uh, innocent protesters. And I thought, what would be a word to hear today in the midst of all of this uh, strife and worry and fear. So I turn to the lectionary text from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13, and I saw a string of parables, parable, parables that had um, the ring of hope in them. And I thought, yes, that's what we need to hear today. So this is really a meditation, if you will, a meditation that I hope brings us uh, a measure of comfort and certainly a sense of peace in the middle of no peace. So I'm reading from Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verses 31 through 33, continuing with verses 44 through 48, and then closing with verses 51 through 53. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come to make nests in its branches. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field which someone found and hid then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place. I imagine that ever since the species Homo sapien was able to scrawl on a cave wall or utter an intelligible word. 
human beings have been trying to describe God, trying to imagine how we got here and where we are going and what's behind it all. With the help of my computer resources, I went to the Google Internet search engine and typed in the words, Describe God. An impressive 588 million hits came up. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I also typed in, Describe Human. And that turned up 626 million references. I guess we tend to be a bit more preoccupied with ourselves than with God. I did not have time to explore those millions of descriptions of God, but I suppose that they cover the spectrum from the most intimate articulations to the broadest and boldest claims. Our own Presbyterian tradition was deeply influenced by the description of God found in the Westminster Confession of Faith, whose shorter catechism may have been for some of us in our youth a part of our confirmation process into church membership. This is what Westminster has to say about God. There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory. Most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. That sounds to me like an awesomely big and unapproachable and, to my ears, ultimately mean and nasty God. A God that we better look out for or else suffer the consequences. I dare say that some of us grew up in contexts that preached this view of God. And we may have spent many years undoing the tyranny of such a God. But is that the God or the kingdom of God that Jesus is describing here in the Gospel of Matthew? A mustard seed, a tiny seed that grows into an impossibly big plant, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. A bit of yeast, yeast that is mixed with a quantity of flour that causes the whole dough to rise into bread. A treasure hidden in a field that when discovered causes the discoverer to sell all and buy that field a pearl of great value that, when found, results in the finders selling all to possess it. A fishing net that catches fish of every kind, a treasure chest containing both the old and the new. Perhaps it is in that chest of old and new that we might find our treasure, a God of healing and wholeness for all today and tomorrow and always. 
Too often these days, if we hear of God at all, it is one who is the great wish fulfiller, a benevolent butler, a cosmic Santa Claus, he who will fulfill all desires and solve all problems. But what if God, what if the kingdom of God is to be found not, in, not hidden in extraordinary places where treasure hunters would be sure to look, but in the last place any of us would look, in the ordinary circumstances of our everyday lives? What if we ignore the hundreds of millions of internet suggestions of what God is or where the kingdom of heaven might be and turn our attention closer to home? What if we laid aside the doctrinal questions of our religion, the divisive struggles of who has the true faith and who does not, and instead turned our attention to Jesus? The Jesus who says, when did you see me hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, in prison? My preaching mentor, a mentor at a distance, Barbara Brown Taylor, says it beautifully. If we want to speak of heavenly things, we may begin by speaking about earthly things. And if we want to describe that which is beyond all words, we may begin with words we know, words such as man, woman, field, seed, bird, air, yeast, bread, words such as pearl, net, sea, fish, joy. The kingdom is like these. The kingdom is found in these things. These are the places to dig for the kingdom of heaven. These are the places to look for the will and rule and presence of God. If we cannot find them here, we will never find them anywhere else. For earth is where the seeds of heaven are sown, and their treasure is the only one worth having. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like, and the great wonder and miracle of it is that he, or we, cannot really say. The grace of it is this. The kingdom is many things we can see and experience in our lives every day. The kingdom present in seeds and birds and yeast and bread. The kingdom lived out in fields and seas and women and men and children. We won't find the kingdom off in some cosmic realm, for God has hidden it in the stuff of our lives. And if we want to find it, we can start looking right where we are, because, as Barbara Taylor says, earth is where the seeds of heaven are sown. Instead of a settled faith, old, tired, predictable, these parables of the kingdom treat us to surprising possibilities. Things may not be what they seem. Futures may not be closed. Bad news may not be the last word. Death may not be the end. Hope 
may be hidden here, right under our noses. In God's world, anything can happen. And somehow, even though we may not notice and are still searching diligently, God is working good out of chaos, throwing a wide net and catching all of creation up in it. Thanks be to God. Amen. Praise the hidden God of love, in whom we all must live and move, who shepherds us at every stage, who youth, maturity, and age, who challenged us. When we were young, who stormed the citadels of wrong, in care for others taught us love, God's true community must grow. Who bid us Now, praise the hidden God of love, in whom we all must live and move, who proves to us that we have still a work to do, a place to fill. Let this be our hope, this day and this week, and carrying it even further if we can, let us feel some peace, trusting that God is at work in the world, even when we cannot see it, and that perhaps we might see more of God's work if we looked within, if we looked within others, places that we would never suspect. Let this be our hope. And as you leave this service, go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, that together we are being empowered for faithful witness and loving service by Holy Spirit this and every day. And may God's hope, peace, joy, and love run through you this day and always. Amen.